Hey, let, let's begin with the Milovan Rahivac. I mean, since he left Ghana in 2010, did some great things. He went to the AFCON final, then the World Cup quarterfinals. Uh, he made Ghana a very difficult team to beat. Then he left. The next time we saw him on the African continent was in charge of Algeria, but he was only in charge for, I'm not sure, two matches, three matches, and then he left. Yeah. Can you just, just basically walk us through what his tenure was like there? So uh, he took over after uh, Algeria had uh, one man, Christian Gourkouf, in charge. Christian Gourkouf was very close to the players. Uh, they were all, all speaking French. Uh, he was known as a player's coach. Uh, training sessions were fun. They liked to play attacking football. Uh, and on several occasions, the players lobbied to keep him in a position because he had wanted to quit on, on two or three occasions. So they had a very tight-knit connection. Christian Grukov eventually left. And when he left, Milovan Rajevac was appointed, as you mentioned. It wasn't quite clear what was going on at camp, but we could feel that there was a little bit of tension. Uh, Milovan Rajevac was not fired for his record. He, played, he coached two matches. He won one, 6-0, against Lesotho. And he drew one against Cameroon, 1-1, one, one, which are not horrible results. We've had coaches with much worse results last for longer. However, main key players of the team came out after, and they were complaining about his coaching style. Uh, the, the main figure being Sofiane Faguli, who uh, is 33 years old, but he's been playing with the national team since 2013. And he, was say, he said something along the lines of, he didn't even know our names. So he would talk about Raiz and Boli, who was the goalkeeper, and he would say, hey, you, goalkeeper. Or speaking about uh, Sofiane Faguli himself, he would say, hey, the, the men playing at West Ham. So you understand that he was not very close to the players, and the players did not like that. The players have a lot of player power in Algeria, and so eventually he was dismissed simply for that. Wow. I mean, that is very interesting indeed. And, uh, you know, you have to say that, uh, for example, that, you know, for a coach that was so widely successful, uh, especially with Ghana, this was a bit awkward, wasn't it? Uh, I mean, even from the manager's point of view, um, what do you think was the reason they probably said, you know what, okay, after two games and all of these complaints, we got to let him go? Instead of saying, you know what, maybe we give him a bit of time, maybe he gets to know the players and things can get better. Honestly, the decision was contested in Algeria at the time. Uh, a lot of supporters were saying maybe players have too much power if they have the ability to uh, almost conduct a mutiny of sorts to try and get rid of the coach. Uh, the players went and spoke to the Federation president directly saying, we do not want this guy. So it, it wasn't necessarily taken well in Algeria, especially as the following results after Rajevac were not great. Um, that said, uh, his results were not out of this world too. We're, Algeria is expected to be Lesotho with all due respect to that beautiful country. And the Cameroon 1-1 is again, a quite logical result. He didn't put in incredible results. Uh, but he really was in Algeria surfing on that wave of, oh, he got Ghana to uh, the quarterfinals, one kick away from the semifinals. He got, me, make, for me, Ghana making the, the final of the Africa Cup of Nations is not an exploit. You guys do it almost every year. And I apologize to say that you almost fail <laughs> at every single final as well. So, so his results were, were really like, for me, they were logical, but they were not really extraordinary. And he was sort of yeah. surfing on that reputation. What is worrying is that since he left Ghana, he hasn't really held a position for more than a, a year or so. So that is very quite, that is quite worrying. Okay. I, and, uh, you know, I, I move away from Algeria, of course, because you're also a very uh, important African football expert. You have a lot, a lot of knowledge. You follow the game for so long on the continent, obviously. What do you personally make of this whole uh, idea of him coming back? Obviously, it's not been confirmed yet, but like you pointed out, it's been 10 years. You look at his record ever since he left Ghana, you rightly mentioned it's not been that great. And Algeria, I'm sure uh, themselves have had their own situations with second comings of national team coaches. What do you make of the whole uh, situation? If he does get hired, great decision or not? You, we always judge a manager by their results. So it's, it's always difficult to say uh, beforehand. That said, um, I honestly feel like it's an appointment that's maybe five or six years too late. Um, the CK O'Connor, I, I mean, I, I have kept an eye on, on Ghana, but just from a distance, obviously not as well as uh, many of the local journalists uh, know. I, I, when I looked at the game sheet when Ghana played against South Africa, and I went, look, this, that's not a, a very strong Ghana side now, is it? And I eventually learned that uh, a lot of the players were, could not make it down due to, to the COVID-19 uh, restrictions. But I do believe that like right now, Ghana is at a very strategic time where there are incredibly talented young players and there really needs to be a regeneration. Players like Kamaladin Suleimana, 
uh, the, the other boy at Ajax Amsterdam, I'm forgetting Kudus, his name Kudus now. Mohamed. Yeah, Mohamed Kudus, exactly. Uh, even Abdul Fatou Isahaku, I've been, I've, been, I've been looking at him now. The same, wow, he looks, he looks like a younger, more explosive Mubarak Wakaso. So honestly, I think uh, this Ghana side, like there really is a, a, a new generation of young talent. And me personally, I would have preferred if they made a younger appointment. Local, not local for me, that's, that's really a, a false debate, but maybe a younger coach that can relate more to players because these younger players, they really do need to connect with the coach on a psychological level. Uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, back to Algeria now, uh, and I really want to pick your thoughts because, I mean, from here, every time, obviously, like you mentioned, it looks like we're going through a bit of a transition at the moment. And it would make sense to appoint a younger coach that understands these modern day footballers because this generation is totally different from the generation that Rahim Raj coached 10 years ago. The Montaris, yes. the attitude, everything is different. And obviously the talent now, even yesterday, Club Bruch, uh, there was one Ghanaian there, Kamal So, or he was brilliant, you know, in that Club Bruch game against yeah. PSG yeah. yesterday. And then even in the Sheriff Clearsport Very good. game, there was another one called Edmond Ado. He had a really good game from, from central yeah. midfield Defensive as well. Midfield. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. There, there is a lot of, you know, Saram Ting, Salisu, brilliant footballer. Like everywhere you look, there's talent everywhere, you know, at the moment. Uh, Algeria is always the go-to example for most of us here now. We say, okay, take a look at Algeria, look at their players. They don't necessarily play in the biggest leagues in the world, necessarily. Maris is a big player, but the rest of them, some of them are in the golf. But when you have a team, you have a team. You know, this is the most important thing. Absolutely. From all. From Algeria's point of view, at the moment, realistically, what do you make of a team as it stands? Is it the same team that won the Cup of Nations two years ago? Or going to Cameroon, what are the expectations? Look, we're just about there. This was the main discussion after Algeria uh, drew with Burkina Faso uh, in the last match. Uh, people were saying, we're not exactly at that 2019 level, but we're about there. We're maybe 90% of that top level that we had reached when we were playing the Cup of Nations. Of course, Algeria hasn't lost a match in 28 matches. So that's uh, the a continental record. Uh, second only to Italy in world football, who have set, I believe, a new record with 36 matches unbeaten. So that this, man, this team is, is incredible, and really the credit comes down to one man, and that's the coach, which is why I brought up that point about Rajevac. Because this coach, Jamal Belmadi, is a former international. He's only in his mid-40s. A lot of these players remember him playing. He's young enough to be uh, really to relate to the players. He's also French-Algerian, like a lot of French-Algerians are. Uh, in the national team, but he's also old enough to be seen as a source, of, like an authority figure. So the, the, he's really at that, that that perfect age. He's a modern coach. He has his qualifications, his coach, coaching badges. So really, he deserves all the credit because this team is the practically the same team that missed out on the 2018 World Cup. But he's taken them and he's really made them into a force. So that's why coaches like him, Ali Yusisu uh, at Senegal, even like young African coaches like Benedict McCarthy at South Africa is doing a fantastic job with Amazulu. Yep. Uh, Radi Jaidi with the uh, Tunisian coach who's now going to be coaching uh, Esperance de Tunis. There are a lot of good young African coaches who are qualified. I think maybe it's a little bit better to give them their shot. However, like I said, we can only judge Ryavac on his results. Okay. Uh, one last one for you. Um, Algeria missed out in the, in the last World Cup, obviously. Uh, but the following year, they won the Cup of Nations. I'm sure a lot of people would have forgotten about that 2018 miss. But certainly, yeah. after 2022, they're not just looking to qualify. This is a team that could make a mark. Is that a conversation that's happening locally about what potentially this generation of players could achieve? Absolutely. That, it really is the bullseye. Qatar 2022 is the bullseye. Uh, this coach and these players have, he, he's on several occasions also been angry at the way that the Federation has uh, conducted affairs. He wanted to leave on, on one occasion or two. Uh, however, he with his players came to an agreement that they have this end goal, which is Qatar 2022. And we really believe that after that, the coach Jamal Blumadi might be coaching elsewhere. He might try his hand maybe at a, at a top five European uh, club. So this really is the bullseye. And, and as you mentioned, there are uh, five, six players in this national team that play in Qatar that are some of the best players in Qatar. The coach, Jamal Belmadi, used to be the coach of the Qatari national team. So before AFCON 2019, we actually did our training camp out there in Qatar. So it almost does feel like a second home of sorts. There's a very big Algerian diaspora there as well of uh, almost 10,000 uh, Algerians. So it will feel like a home field advantage. And really the, the plan is to sort of replicate what Ghana did in 2010. And who knows, maybe go further, but it will be very, very difficult. The first step is qualifying. Absolutely. But I do believe that if Algeria do qualify, that would be very, very strong indeed. Uh, one last question for you. I'm, I'm sure you've seen the way uh, 
the way the season has started for Ray Admirers. Nobody knows what's going on with Pep Guardiola. One of his best uh, wingers from last season suddenly isn't playing. Is that something that's worrying to you guys or what's going on there? Well, he started at, at, in the Champions League fixture uh, yesterday. Uh, he played well. He scored a goal against uh, Red Bull Leipzig. Um, and with Pep Guardiola, he's always sort of been this way. Since Mares has been at City, he's always had a very uh, big rotation of players. You know, instead of a, a top 11, he has really a top 18 where players rotate in and out. And only re the really best players get to play every game, like a Kevin De Bruyne. Uh, now Jack, Jack Grealish is in very good form, the, the English midfielder. So uh, worried, no, because we know for, for Algerians, the main thing is we need Mares at his very best level at the World Cup. And we believe he'll be there, even if he's playing one out of two matches or two out of three matches at Manchester City. Uh, we really only care about Mares at the national team. And we believe that staying at Manchester City, he's going to progress tactically and he's going to keep his level uh, high. So not too worried, but uh, it's not ideal situation as well, especially when you see other African stars like Sadio Mane, Mohamed Salah playing all the time. Uh, we would like Mar Mares to play all the time at the, so he can have better stats and maybe compete for African Player of the Year. Because like this, I don't think he's going to win it. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was going to be the last thing I asked. I mean, you look at last season, a lot of the players did really well. Salah had a great season. Mm. Um, even uh, the Chelsea goalkeeper had a really great season. Mendy. Uh, yeah, Mahrez Mendy. had a really great season. I mean, from an African football journalist's point of view, how do you think that's going to that's gonna go? I mean, who are you tilting towards? Yeah, it's tough. Um Usually it goes to, in, in a year where there's no international competition like a Cup of Nations or a World Cup, usually it goes to the player that maybe advances the furthest in the, in the European Champions League. But when you look at the Chelsea squad, as you mentioned, Edward Mendy is the only one that would really qualify. Hakim Ziyech, the Moroccan uh, attacking midfielder, didn't really play in that uh, uh, Champions League final, even if he is a fantastic player. Uh, Mares himself had a great Champions League campaign last season. He scored in the semifinals and the quarterfinals. Uh, in the final, he was sort of nullified like the rest of the city side. But uh, honestly, for me, he had a good chance of becoming African Player of the Year if he had won that Champions League. And if he continued it with, you know, another two, three months of, of very good form with the city. Uh, that hasn't been the case. So I imagine maybe he'll be in the top three. But maybe why not give it to a goalkeeper? It's, I think it's been a very long time since the goalkeepers won it. So maybe since the Cameroon, Cameroonian uh, gentleman, uh, Thomas Nkono and Joseph Antoine Bell. So why, why not Edward Mendy? I think he deserves it. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. And as a Chelsea fan, that's added bonus. <laughs> really. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about that. Uh, yeah, There's yeah. a lot of Chelsea fans in, in Ghana, yeah? There are. Okay. Um, because of Essen, obviously, yeah. yeah. Uh, is that um, the same in Algeria now? Or with, are there a lot of Algerians that are Man City fans? Or just like, you know what, it's Man City playing, okay. Maris is there, okay. But not really like fans. It was rare. No, not really fans. It was random, but Leicester City were very popular here two years ago because they had Mahrez and Slimani at the same time. And they were like, it, it became very weird because I thought to myself, oh, 10 years ago, they were in the second division. Nobody had even heard of them. And now they're the most popular team in Algeria. So it's funny how that can, how that can happen. That's a great, it's a great fairytale story. Perfect football story, really. Uh, Leicester yeah, City. for but, sure. Uh, for no, sure. I hope thank you very much.